You're listening to A New Beginning with Greg Laurie, a podcast supported by Harvest Partners. For more ways to deepen and challenge your spiritual walk, enroll in Pastor Greg's free online courses. Sign up at harvest.org. Mary realized Jesus was coming to die on the cross, and she wanted to do something for him to show her love. Mary demonstrated her love for Jesus in an extravagant way. Many were surprised, but Pastor Greg Laurie says she actually set a good example. The more we discover about what Jesus has done for us will cause us to want to do more for Him. The Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. This is the day when the lost are found. If the gift someone gives you is modest, your expression of thanks can likewise be modest. When the gift is extraordinary, a modern etiquette expert says keep the level of the thank you near the level of the kindness you received. Well, today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg Laurie takes us to a memorable moment in Jesus' ministry when gratitude was extended him at such a generous level, it drew attention and even criticism from the disciples. But Pastor Greg explains Jesus commended Mary. Let's pick up where we last left off in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is headed to the cross. He has plainly declared that to his disciples at a place called Caesarea Philippi. He told them he was going to be betrayed, he was going to be crucified, and he would rise again on the third day. And this came as bad news to his boys because his popularity was at its total peak The name of Jesus was on everyone's lips. He was trending on social media. Well, he would have been if this happened today. Matthew chapter 12, verse 12 said, large crowds gathered to him and he got into a boat and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And then Luke 12, one says, thousands of people had gathered together and they were stepping on one another. So everybody wanted to get close to Jesus. And so he was very popular. But ironically... These same people that were expressing their interest in him would soon turn against him when he made his way to the cross. Even his own hand-picked disciples did not fully understand what he was about to do. He had come to die on the cross. This was always the plan from the very beginning. And even though he spoke about it in great detail, his disciples missed it with one exception. And it wasn't John known for his spiritual perception. It wasn't Peter, normally known for his outspokenness. It wasn't Andrew. It wasn't Matthew. It wasn't one of the apostles. It wasn't a man. It was a woman. And she was not one of the apostles. But she understood what Jesus had come to do. And her name was Mary. Now, there's a lot of Marys in the Bible. So sometimes we get confused. First of all, there's Mary, the mother of Jesus. Then there's Mary Magdalene. And then there is Mary and Martha, okay? So this is Mary of Mary and Martha fame. It's worth noting that every time we read of Mary, she is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Maybe that's why she had this great insight. Uh, We remember one occasion when Jesus came over to her home where she lived with her sister Uh, Martha and her brother Lazarus. And uh, Martha went into the kitchen to make a great feast for Jesus. And Mary was just sitting at his feet. And this frustrated Martha because it's a lot of work to prepare a meal. And she comes out demanding that Mary join her in the kitchen. And Jesus made an amazing statement to Martha. He said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Think about that. Mary chose what is better. We have that same choice to do the right thing, to not do the wrong thing. We can be like manic Marthas flitting here and there, going about our business, or we can be like Mary and take the time to sit at his feet and hear what he has 
to say. And when you choose what is better, as Jesus said Mary did, you're making the best choice. And that's where she discovered this essential truth. Mary realized Jesus was coming to die on the cross. I know it seems obvious to us now. But no one else got this. She knew he was coming to die on the cross. And she also understood that's where he was now headed. She thought, I've got to do something profound. I have to do something significant that will show my thankfulness to him, my love for him, my devotion to him. So she brings this great gift. And Jesus said, this will now be a memorial to her wherever the gospel is preached. So what exactly did Mary do? What was this profound gift that so moved Jesus? He wanted to memorialize it. Let's read about it now. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse one. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, uh, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those who were present said, oh, this is worth more than a year's wages. Why this waste of perfume? This could have been sold and the money could have been given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Now look at the response of Jesus. He said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? The poor you always have with you and you can help them anytime you want but you don't always have me with you. She did what she could. She poured perfume in my body beforehand in preparation for my burial. And I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Now just stop and think about this. This is a meal. This is a dinner. And what a collection of people. We've got the Lord himself there. But you know who else was there? Lazarus. Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, who had just been raised from the dead. Man, I would have wanted to ask Lazarus a few questions. So, wow, what happened? What was it like to die and go to the other side? And what did you see there? Incredible. So they're all gathered around, probably talking to Lazarus, and a lot of questions for Jesus. He had just delivered what we call the Olivet Discourse, uh, recorded in Matthew 24. And basically that's where Jesus talked about the end times. And they probably had more questions about that. What did you mean when you said the abomination of desolation? And to explain this all to us. So this was quite the night that they were having together. But everything was sort of coming to a head in the life and ministry of Jesus. And now Mary, watching all of this, is so moved. She knows what Jesus is about to do. So she does this, verse three. A woman came with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume and broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Now this probably was a family heirloom. As it's been pointed out, it was worth a year's wages. So it was worth thousands and thousands of dollars. Under normal circumstances, just a few drops uh, from a bottle like this would be sufficient. She pours the whole bottle on him and then wipes his feet with her hair. But Judas is very critical. Maybe he had his little calculator out. He knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. He calculated it and said, this is a waste. And, and it did seem like a waste, but it actually wasn't a waste at all. I read that one of the most expensive perfumes that you can buy is called Clive Christian Number no. 1 Imperial Majesty. Oh my, that's a very impressive title, isn't it? It's a combination of mandarin orange, Indian jasmine, white peach, lemon, and more. And it costs you $200,000 a bottle. Oh, but wait, they deliver it in a Bentley. (laughs) So that's a lot of money to spend on perfume, but it even gets crazier. The most expensive perfume you can buy today is called, here you go, sucker. No, I made that up. It's actually uh, called Shamaku. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. And frankly, I don't even care. But uh, this comes in a crystal bottle uh, covered in diamonds, pearls, and gold. 
And how much does it cost? Are you ready for this? $1,295,000. Then again, you can go over to Amazon and order some Jade East for around $22, or High Karate for $56, or Old Spice for about $13. And there's Brute, don't forget that. But you know, the idea here is, it is not how much this costs, it's how much it costs her. It cost her a lot. She was giving the most precious thing she owned to Jesus. Pastor Greg Laurie will have the second half of his message in just a moment. We really enjoy when Harvest Ministries and Pastor Greg's teachings are impacting lives. Pastor Greg, you are my favorite pastor. You preach from the heart and I learn so much from you. God bless you and your family. I told my daughter and her family about you. They live right by your church and have started attending. Praise the Lord. Hi, Pastor Greg. Your book, Fame, along with the Jesus Revolution film, has led me back to Jesus. They've also shown God's love for a sinner like me. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be able to provide so many resources through Harvest Ministries. Check them out for yourself at harvest.org. And would you consider becoming a Harvest Partner? If so, you can make a donation at harvest.org. That's harvest.org. Well, Pastor Greg is pointing out that Mary, Martha's sister, gave the most precious thing she had to the Lord. It was a surprising gesture, but the Lord commended her. What is the most precious thing that you own? What is more valuable to you than anything else? Now, question. Would you be willing to give that to Jesus. That's what this is all about. We remember the story of that young man we call the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus in this super cool tricked out chariot, lowered, <laughs> drinking a latte. Probably not. But uh, he comes up to Jesus and he says, uh, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus reminds him of some of the commandments and this rich young ruler uh, says, well, all these I've kept from my youth up and Jesus probably left out loud. The Bible doesn't say, but no one's kept the commandments from his youth up. And here's what I find fascinating. After this brash and arrogant young man said he had kept the commandments, we read this statement. Jesus looked at the man and felt genuine love for him. And then Jesus made this statement. There's one thing you haven't done. Go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Listen to this. And then the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Understand, this was never about the man's stuff. Jesus didn't want his stuff. He just saw that in the heart of this young man, those things were more important to him than anything else, including God. He says, hey, there's one thing you need to do. See, that young ruler missed the one thing and he walked away sad. He wasn't willing to let it go. But Mary, she got that one thing. One thing is essential, Jesus said of Mary. And she has chosen it. Well, Judas did not get it. And so he criticized it. Judas is typical of so many people today. Like dutiful Pharisees, they want to give the bare minimum to God. They'll lamely ask questions like, can you do this and still technically go to heaven? Uh, can I get away with this and still call myself a Christian? Those are the wrong questions. We'll, we'll give our leftovers to God, if you will. We'll pray briefly if we think of it. Uh, we'll read the Bible if we can make time in our busy schedules for it. And, uh, and then what's even worse is we will criticize others that are more committed to the Lord than we are. Maybe that's one of the reasons why the early church changed their world. Maybe that's why the early church turned their world upside down because they had a sense of abandon. Uh, God would tell Philip, go to the desert. And he went in obedience to the Lord. God would tell Peter, reach down and take that man by the hand and pull him to his feet. And he would do it. They took risks and they left their comfort zone. Why? Because the scripture says they had been with Jesus. Acts 4.13 says the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John because they were ordinary men. They had no special training, but they recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. 
Can someone tell you've been with Jesus? Can they see it reflected in your life? Does the fragrance of your life fill the room as it did with Mary and her gift to the Lord? It's a wonderful thing when people see that and ask us why we are the way that we are and they want to know more about us and then we can share the gospel. Now again, I want to emphasize Mary did not have the same privileges as the disciples. They spent pretty much every waking hour in the presence of Jesus for some three years. She was with him sporadically. But she was going to take advantage of this opportunity. She's going to listen to him. She's going to learn from him. And she's going to bring a great gift to him. Because she could see the lines etching his face. And read or write the problems reflected in his eyes. And she understood he had said what he meant. And he meant what he said. He was going to die on a cross. And that broke her heart. So she was going to bring her tribute to Jesus now. She would not wait until he was gone. And I want to remind you right now, there might be someone that you know and love. And I want to ask you, when's the last time you told them you love them? Well, I'll, I'll say something nice at their funeral service. Well, they won't be around to hear that, will they? So bring your flowers now. If there's someone you love and appreciate, tell them now. If you have regrets, deal with that now and make the appropriate changes. Uh, if there's someone you need to forgive, do it now. And why should you forgive someone? You say, well, they don't deserve my forgiveness. My response is, do you deserve to be forgiven by God? The answer is no. So the Bible says, forgive as God in Christ has forgiven you. See, forgiving a person isn't letting them off the hook. It's a way for you to get free of your bitterness. Because the one that's being hurt more by your lack of forgiveness is not the person that hurts you. It's you. As I've said so many times, when you forgive a person, you set a prisoner free yourself. And so this woman said, I'm going to do it now. Listen, now is the time to share that gospel with the person. Now is the time to make that change in your life. Seize the moment. Carpe diem is the expression. That's exactly what Mary did. But of course, Judas thought it was a waste and he criticized her for it. But then John gives us an interesting little detail about Judas. He said, Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor. He said this because he was a thief. Basically, Judas was hanging onto the money for the disciples and he was pocketing it. And so this had nothing to do with his concern for the poor. And that reminds me of a very important point about critical people. Sometimes the people that complain the most actually do the very least. And sometimes the people who are aiming accusations at you are revealing something about themselves. The thing they're accusing you of is actually what they are personally guilty of. After all, it was Judas who sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So Careful, if you're always harping on a certain sin over and over again, you may be telling us more about yourself than you want to reveal. And so things are not always as they seem. From the outside, Judas looked thrifty and careful and spiritual. And the woman looked frivolous and wasteful and silly. But the very opposite was true. Judas was evil and greedy and wicked. And she was thoughtful and godly and committed. So things are not always as they appear. You know, we always think Judas would have been the easiest guy to identify. You know, all the other disciples wore white robes and he wore a black robe. <laughs> a black leather robe with the collar turned up, right? No, of course not. In fact, Judas was such a good actor, such an effective faker, that when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, no one suspected Judas. You would have thought that someone would have said, I bet it's Matthew. He used to work for Rome. It's him, isn't it? No. They said, is it me? No one thought Judas, if he was as obvious as people thought he might have been, they would have all pointed in unison and said, it's Judas, isn't it? The guy who wears the black robe. No, no one suspected Judas because he was such a good actor, but he was a liar. And it's interesting because Judas accused her of being wasteful. Yet Jesus would say of Judas, 
He was the son of waste. Jesus called Judas a son of perdition, which means a son of waste. He was the very thing he accused her of being. Now Jesus commends her as an example to us. Look at verse eight. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. She did what she could because she understood that he would do what he did. In the same way, the more we discover about what Jesus has done for us will cause us to want to do more for him. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. She saw this love that was driving him. She saw this concern for her and the others and all of humanity. And so she wanted to do something for him to show her love. Good inspiration for us today here on A New Beginning. Pastor Greg Laurie pointing out Mary's extravagant love and gratitude for the Lord. And there's more to come from this message. Mary's heart was filled with thanks for what Jesus had done. And our hearts are filled with thankfulness as well. Jesus gave his life for our sins. He paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. Have you ever come to the Lord to accept the debt he paid on your behalf? Have you ever come to him and accepted his offer of forgiveness and eternal life? Here's Pastor Greg with more. Jesus did all the heavy lifting. He carried the cross for you. He died on that cross that he carried. This isn't about what you do. It's about what he's done. But here's what the Bible says. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You say, well, okay, how do I do that? You do it through prayer. And if you pray this prayer after me, I believe God will hear it and answer it, and Christ will come to live inside of you. So if you want Jesus to come into your life and forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that you'll go to heaven when you die, if you want to fill that big hole in your heart, pray these words if you would. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin. I am sorry for my sin, and I turn from it now. And I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Be my Savior and my Lord. Be my God and my friend. Thanks for hearing this prayer and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, I want you to know that God has heard you and has answered it. The Bible says, these things we write to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may know it's yours now. God has given it to you because it's the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Congratulations and welcome to the family of God. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we want to help you begin your new relationship with the Lord on the right foot. Would you let us send you a free gift? It's Pastor Greg's New Believer's Bible. You know, scores of people have read this edition of God's Word. New believers love the study helps written just for them. And they appreciate that it's in an easy-to-understand translation. We'll be glad to send it to you today. Just ask for the New Believer's Bible when you call 1-800-821-3300. You can call any time, 1-800-821-3300, or go online to Harvest. Org. Well, we're excited to make available a new devotional book for kids called Marvel at the Moon. It's written by our good friend, pastor and author Levi Lesko. Ninety devotions, all based on the amazing things to be discovered in outer space and God's creation. Uh, Levi, did you have devotion times with your parents when you were a kid? Yeah, my dad, who is my hero and my best friend, he was the best man at my wedding, He's currently fighting pancreatic cancer and uh, been walking with him through that journey. Um, Ever since I was a little boy, you know, he has just been so good to lead me in devotions as a family. We always, now we were, we didn't always make it easy on him. You know, we would be crawling all over the couch and, you know, (laughs) raising a fuss. And, and, and I always tell parents, you know, lower your expectations. If you're expecting your kids to be sitting like they're in a cathedral, you, you need to adjust your expectations. Um, you, mm-hmm. you may not get two, three minutes in, you may, but they're, they're going to remember that you tried. 
and they're going to remember that you made it a priority to open up scripture and to point them to these things. And and I think so fondly back on me as a young man, and I'm trying to continue that legacy with my kids. And I believe that, you know, by God's grace, they'll do that with their kids as well. Amen. That's great insight from Pastor Levi Lusco. And I've got a resource for you. And I, we've been talking about it with Levi. It's his new book, Marvel at the Moon. This is a way to get those conversations started with your children, even with your grandchildren. So it's 90 devotions based on outer space and the Bible written by Pastor Levi Lusco. This book is accessible. It's fun. It's beautifully illustrated. And it will not only engage the interest of the child— It'll engage your interest as well as you read it to them. So you can order your copy of Marvel at the Moon from us here at Harvest Ministries. And listen to this. You can have it for your gift of any size. Now, some maybe can only give a little, and we appreciate that, but others can be more generous. And I encourage you to be generous because whatever you give will be used to carry this ministry on so more people can hear the Word of God taught and hear the gospel proclaimed. So order your copy of this new devotional by Levi Lusco, Marvel at the Moon. Yeah, we have a copy waiting for you. Just get in touch with your investment and ask for Pastor Levi's new devotional book, Marvel at the Moon. The fastest way to connect is to go to our website, harvest.org, or just give us a phone call, 1-800-821-3300. We can take your call anytime, again at one 800 821 3300. Hey everybody, I want to encourage you to join us for something we call Harvest at Home. It happens every Sunday at harvest.org and on our brand new app, Harvest Plus, which is available on your mobile TV devices. Download it now and you can watch Harvest at Home with Christians from around the world as we worship together and study God's Word. So again, join us for Harvest at Home at harvest.org or on Harvest Plus. Well, next time, more insight on the wise choice Mary made contrasted with the choice of her chief critic, Judas Iscariot. Join us here on A New Beginning with pastor and Bible teacher, Greg Laurie. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to A New Beginning. This is a podcast made possible by Harvest Partners. So for more content that can help you know God and equip you to make Him known to others or to learn more about how you can become a Harvest Partner, just go to harvest.org.